that you know God exists, and the reason you choose evolution is because it gets rid of moral accountability. Evolution... It does that get rid of moral accountability? It does. It means you, your primal instincts, lust and pornography and fornication, adultery, all just primal instincts. That's all. You're just an animal. The Bible demands moral accountability and says those things are wrong, and that's why it's not acceptable to you. That's why you're not seeking after truth. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Oh, I think you're wrong. I say that you know and... All right, he spoke very quickly and there was some audio, so I'll, I'll re-walk you through this. So Ray, um, this student has basically admitted to Ray that he is an atheist uh, because basically evolution has proven that there is no need for a God. And so Ray challenges him. He says, well, isn't creation proof of a creator? And the student did not agree with the premise of that, of that argument, so he disagreed. And then, so, then Ray brings in the idea of a whistleblower. I don't know if you caught that. He says, well, I have a whistleblower. And I believe what he was referring to was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was speaking to him at this point and, and acting on that as, uh, from the Holy Spirit. He says, well, I, I have a whistleblower here. And Ray says, this whistleblower says that you know God exists and the only reason you choose evolution is that it gets rid of moral accountability. And then he wasn't sure what he meant by moral accountability. He, you know, he explained it and, and it's his desire uh, to do whatever he wants. And then finally Ray asked him, am I wrong? And he had to stop and think. And he had to ask again, am I wrong? And you heard the response, well, I think you're wrong. He wasn't sure. And this young student's perspective, I think, was significantly challenged. You know, was evolution just a ticket to sexual freedom? Well, this is not a new idea. Author Aldous Huxley, who was a great supporter of Darwin's theory in 1941, made this remarkable admission. He writes, For myself, as no doubt for most of my contemporaries, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation. Let me back up. What he's saying, the philosophy of meaninglessness, I believe what he's saying is a sense of no purpose in life because we no longer have a God, okay? So he's recognizing that once you get rid of God, you, you no longer have a sense of purpose, and he calls that the philosophy of meaninglessness. So he says the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation. You know, getting rid of God and the sense of purpose actually liberated me. He says, the liberation we desired was simultaneously liberation from a certain political and economic system and liberation from a certain system of morality. And here's the key verse. He, and he wrote this. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. So basically, he's admitting that he's using Darwinism to get rid of the idea of a God so that he would not have God looking over his shoulder and he could do whatever he wanted without a sense of guilt. When challenged by atheists, the first thing you must do, and really, now let's get to our response. What is our response? And, and um, when we are challenged, the first thing we must do is to not back down. And I must admit, there will be times when their challenge will seem this intimidating. Don't be surprised of how passionately they present their case. But ultimately, this is a spiritual issue. And you can be assured that the spiritual realm is involved in this battle. So do not back down. Because if you take a stand and you show your accountability to God, that actually puts pressure on them to do the same. I mean, that's the reason they're attacking you. Because you are providing that mirror. You are showing, you, you, you showing your accountability to God. That makes them feel guilty. And so in order to get rid of that guilt, they will attack you. Because if the Christian worldview is correct, then they are in big trouble. So you know they aren't going to be neutral. 
It's not going to be, uh, the, let's agree to disagree. Let's, it, it's not, let's just get along. They aren't going to promote open and honest discussion of the issue, and so they are going to actively attack you and your faith. And that's precisely what the professor did in the movie. But what is ironic is how they've got it backwards. Because it really works the other way around. Submitting our lives to God and to his son actually frees us from the bondage of sin. Yes, there might be some guilt involved when we wrong God, and that's the guilt they're trying to get away from, but they're trying to get away from it the wrong way. Because our God is a God who loves his creation. First of all, he loved us so much that he gave us these laws to follow. Because in actuality, the laws that he has given us are good laws. Realize that if a society could ever fully live the laws that he has given us, we would be living in a utopian society. We would literally be living in heaven on earth if his laws were obeyed. And so these laws are good laws. But given the fact that we cannot live lives perfectly, we also know that he forgives us for the times that we fail. And that forgiveness brings peace. And so we don't have to live in anger. We don't have to live lives with chips on our shoulder as we defy God and do everything in our power to demean and to attack those who believe in him. So we must take a stand. We must be watchmen on the wall and understand our culture in the time that we live because we were created to serve in our time. If we look at our Old Testament reading today, it was when Jeremiah, as a young youth, was called to be his prophet. And he said, before I formed you, God said in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And then if we look at Acts, when God, Jesus appeared to Saul and uh, the, uh, during Saul's conversion to the Apostle Paul, and Jesus says to Saul, rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. And what's that purpose? To appoint you as a servant and a witness to the things in which you have seen me and to, the, to those in which I will appear to you, will appear to you. God, before he even created you, had a plan for your life. To be a witness for him. And just as Paul was appointed by God as a servant and a witness to things which he has seen, you are appointed by God as a servant and a witness to what you have seen. So my friends, as you struggle with friends, and I'm really focusing on high school and college age students because you're going to receive the brunt of this more than probably us as adults. As you struggle with friends who challenge your faith, recognize that God is putting someone in your life to share with. So focus on your part. Focus on God's plan for your life. So you may ask, well, what am I going to say? Or what should I say? Well, that's going to be the topic as we get further into our sermon series. Today's topic is take a stand. Next week, our topic will be say something. So we'll spend a little time as to maybe things that we can say and how we can handle their arguments. And we hope to build a case to show why faith, in fact, is reasonable. And you don't have to throw reason out the door. So I encourage you, if you have friends that this might speak to, to invite them uh, for the sermon series as we go along. But my purpose and goal today is for us to see the battle for what it is. 
This is a battle between spiritual forces. And it gets to the very core of who we are and how we want to live our lives. And I think as we go through this battle, it helps to understand that because it helps us to prepare to face the insurmountable challenge that we will face at times. Now, after we saw the movie, we talked a little bit with the youth, and we did talk a little bit that maybe in the movie the attack on Christianity was a little bit over-dramatized, and I would tend to agree with that, although when you look at some of these websites, um, uh, you know, maybe the attack is that strong. But uh, I don't want to paint a general caricature of atheists. I know there are many atheists out there who are willing to live in peace with people who disagree with them. So I, we don't want to uh, throw this upon all people. In fact, I know there are some people here in our congregation who are married to them, and they get along with them fine. But I do think it's safe to say that the stronger or more violent a person's reaction against your faith, that's an indication of how important it is for them to be free from God. And the reason is, is you have struck a raw nerve in their life. The more violent their reaction to your faith. And maybe it is, as I have suggested today, people want to live free of accountability, or there could be lots of other reasons. Maybe uh, it's possibly rooted in anger and what God has done or what God has not done in their lives, uh, which was the case presented in the movie by the professor. But in either case, your witness to them, your taking a stand and being firm in your faith to God serves as a mirror. And in that mirror, reflecting back at them, it challenges their worldview and it makes them accountable. And if you truly love these people, you will take a stand. You will not back down from your faith. If there is any hope to see or to be with your friend for eternity, In our gospel reading today, we read, they were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. God is not dead. May that be the foundation of our witness. In Jesus' name, amen.